I'm Blake. I'm the director of content strategy here at Launch Notes. Thrilled to be joined today with Marcus Andrews. Marcus is the director of product marketing at Pendo and was doing product marketing at HubSpot before that. Also spent time at Google. Super impressive background. We're really excited to dive into some of what he's learned along the way. And today, Marcus is going to be talking to us about narrative design specifically and how you can turn your company's story into your superpower. And as a quick reminder, members of the Launch Awesome community on Slack get to hear about events like this first. Launch Awesome is a free community for product managers and product marketers to connect and learn from each other. We've got over 200 of the best in product and product marketing in there now. If you want to join, Steve is going to drop a link in the chat right now, and we would love to see you in there. And we're going to start with some great questions. Members of the Launch Awesome community have helped us put together already, and then we'll jump into live questions, like I said, from folks in the audience today. So we'll get through as many as we can. If you want to submit a question, go ahead and drop it in the chat widget on your screen anytime during this talk, and let's get into it. Welcome, Marcus. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Yeah, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I love this audience. You know, we got PMs, we got PMMs. I am a products marketer, but I spend a lot of time with product teams. So it's cool. It's cool that there's a space for this group of people. I like it. You know, that's a great, that's a great point. Let's jump right into that. You mentioned, because you said a term product teams that we've started using a lot at launch notes. And traditionally, there's sort of been this two sort of adjacent teams thinking with product and product marketing and Increasingly, even if the org, char org chart might not reflect it exactly, there's there's kind of this like blending into what we've started using the term product team a lot. And curious, how do you, how do you think about this sort of like blending of the product marketing and product management teams? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of things going on. The product management's changed a lot. Where it used to be, you had to be a CS major to be a, a PM. You know, like there was like, if you were a product manager and you mm. were a CEO, you knew how to code. And now there's a lot of like more, there's more non-technical PMs who are, act, you know, better at sales and communication and writing and marketing and all these other things. And it's like, I think that's pretty helpful as a PM. Like, you know, so much of your job is cross-functional. It's like, it's great to be able to, you know, <clears throat> understand sales and marketing and service. So you can go and sit down with those people and have better conversations. So I think that's changed. And then I think that's, so it's made PMs like, you know, better marketers and they care more about marketing and then product marketing has really grown a lot and just matured a lot too. So I think it used to be like, you know, oh, let's just take a, if it, if it existed at all, which usually it didn't, it's like, you know, let's just take a marketer and kind of hook them up with some product people to start to think about it. But it's the, the role and the amount of PMs has really grown. So I don't know. I see, I see those two things changing and it just creates a better partnership for like, like product teams that care a lot more about like go to market and then, you know, marketing teams that really better understand product. And there's a lot of good things that can happen when you have those two teams working really tightly together. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm getting ahead of myself already. Just so excited for this conversation. <laughs> Let's take a step back. Maybe tell us a little bit about your history in, in product marketing and how you got to where you are today. Yeah. First I worked at a PR agency and then I moved, uh, to a SaaS company after a couple of years of working at a PR agency, I went to school for PR and I was like, this is not for me. I'm not good at this necessarily. In 2010, I got a job at a startup, moved from Boston to San Francisco to work at a startup in Redwood City and worked at this company called Wildfire. I was on like the CS team. And after a year, I got moved kind of into like this value solutions team, which is like a sales enablement team. But basically what I was doing was we didn't have product marketers. Our marketing team was really focused on demand. And there was this huge need to take products that were coming out from the product team and turn them into solutions that the sales team could sell. And that usually like, especially for me, like I was just naturally good at it. And there's a big need for it to create like the slides that help sales do that. So I started doing that <clears throat> and I really liked it. And I wanted to work in marketing because I was considered myself a marketer. Like I like everything that goes with marketing and that type of work. And, but I also liked being really close to product. And then I liked being able to turn these products into solutions because I liked the impact that it had on the sales team. So I was like, what is this? What am I doing? And this is probably around like 2013 or something like that. And I'm like, you know, I'm doing product marketing. This is what, as far as I can tell, this is product marketing. And it was kind of new. Um, 
And at Google at the time, I worked at a startup, I got acquired by Google and then went into Google. And at Google, every marketer is a product marketer. So it's like, it's a little, mm. well, not every marketer, but like most, it's a little confusing. But basically, I, I, I worked my way onto a team where I could do this type of work full time. And then my wife, who's from Boston, we had been in the Bay Area for a while, but we wanted to move back to Boston. And so we moved back to Boston. I joined HubSpot and started working on their product marketing team. And that was great because we had a really strong product marketing team. HubSpot's obviously like an awesome marketing org, but also while I was there really grew and scaled their product org too. So we kind of had this like never ending supply of like awesome launch opportunities, a really good product team to work with. Well, when I started, it was kind of like small and like not great. But by the time I left, I think they're one of the best companies in SaaS at building products, launching products. And uh, so yeah, I was there for five and a half years, you know, learned a ton. I basically learned the process that we're going to talk about narrative design today, which is a thing that I've picked up from working with our CEO, Brian Halligan, and like learning from him, how he thinks about narratives and how he thought about the original narrative, inbound narrative. And then some of the launches we worked on with him and the team. And then <laughs> probably, I think a year and a half ago now, I moved over to Pendo and Pendo is a really exciting product. You know, it's built primarily for product teams. It's built for product led companies. You know, what's, what's most exciting about it is that like this whole, like every company becoming a software company and really products companies becoming more product led feel, feels like the, the beginning of a new wave, you know, that's really taking off, which is just like the kind of company that I'm always looking for and excited to work on. So yeah, that's my, not, not a very short version, but that's my, <laughs> what I've been doing the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a action packed couple years to say the least. And maybe that's, you mentioned narrative design there. Maybe that's a great transition to, to get into this because I'm sure there's going to be plenty to talk about. Can you set the table a little bit on what narrative design, you know, what you see that being, what the kind of like foundations and roots of that actually is and kind of where it is today? Yeah. So, I mean, the simplest way to think about it is it's a storytelling device technique, right? Like a lot of people think that everybody's like, you know, I think a lot of people believe in the power of storytelling, but it's also seen as sort of like a magic quality that just very few have like, oh, you're a good storyteller, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, <clears throat> there's a difference between someone who can like come into a room and like take over a room and tell a good story. Like I'm not necessarily that type of person, but there's stories that like, if you can write a good story and structure a good story and create a story that can be told over and over again and differentiate you in the market and help people pay attention and really set up your company for success. That's, that's what narrative design is aimed at. And like, it's not a, it's not a dark art. It's not, storytelling is not magic. There's, you just need a framework and a process. And I think for a long time, it's just been all art and not enough science and uh, narrative design is simply just a way of like approaching story consistently and like it works for me consistently and it gives you this framework that you can use to build a narrative for your company that lasts for 20 years or you can use to just write like a blog post that's staring you in the face that you need to crank out in an hour you know so mm -hmm. that's how i describe it Nice, nice. I think that's such a good point about being able to almost crack the code behind that. And I think a lot of <clears throat> a lot of folks and, you know, marketers and beyond can get trapped into thinking like you'll see these companies that have these amazing stories and narratives behind them and this like really compelling sort of like, you know, origin and reason and story. And it can be easy yeah. to think like, oh, they just they lucked into that or like, well, they're lucky because they had like this these, you know, four serendipitous things happen, but we didn't have that or there, you know, they just happened into some great story, but we don't have one. It's like you start, once you start to sort of see how these work, you see it's, you know, like, no, you can craft one and you can learn the act and the art and science of putting A to B to C <laughs> together. Yes. It 100%. can be applied so many other places. And it's not so much about like, well, they had a good story, but they didn't. It's like, do you have the right people to kind of connect the dots and tell it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's very true. It is. You can control it. And those companies that do have a strong narrative, they do control it. Usually it's because the CEO, you know, at startups, especially it's usually because the CEO yeah. believes in it and thinks about it and spends time on it. I call it identity, especially for startups. It's like, you, you know, when a startup has a very clear identity because they know mm -hmm. exactly who they are and they're quick to remind you of it, you know? And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, we are the whatever, you know, it's like the examples I usually give are like a gain side or drift, like Drift did this really well when they were mm -hmm. coming up. They were like, we're the conversational marketing company. We believe in these, you know, X, Y, Z. 
and we're always talking about it. And the story's compelling. It's always consistent. I mean, HubSpot did this really well when they started too. It was the in like <clears throat> HubSpot put more money, <clears throat> excuse me, into marketing their new game, which was inbound marketing, their story versus their mm -hmm. actual company. So like when they were spending money on advertising dollars when they were first getting started, they did, yeah. they spent more money on marketing in the idea of inbound marketing than they did actually marketing their like the company and the brand. And it gave them this really strong identity as the inbound marketing company. And that's all they talked about. And it was a simple story. And they kept talking about it again and again and again. And it gave them this very clear identity, which is like, they knew exactly who they are. They reminded you about it a lot. So yeah. 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 No, that's, a, that's the terrific example. And there's, you know, it, it definitely, you saw it in kind of play out with HubSpot, especially where it's like, once folks were bought into the inbound thesis and story, you know, then the next logical step becomes, you know, using that product and service, right. To, yeah. To sort of totally li live the promise they've now, they're now believe you know, bought into. Yes. So that's, yeah. And it's yeah. a good, it's an important part of the process too, is that like you can, you as the humor, like you can take this story and you can do it even without using the, the, the company or the software that created this story, because mm, like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, when you create something like that, it can't just be all about you. You're trying to help people adapt to a change in the world by creating some new process. And like, you have to be true to that and really go out and help people. And like, you can do inbound marketing without <clears throat> buying yeah. HubSpot or using HubSpot. You buy the book, you can read the book, you can implement it. But mm, of course, mm -hmm. there's all these reasons it's hard to do yeah. without uh, yeah. Or, you know. Yeah. And that might be a good litmus test of like, do you really have a good story or do you just have some sort of glossy, you know, some glossy messaging? If, if, have you yeah. given a fancy name to your product or have you actually, are you talking about something that's real and substantial out there in the world? Yeah. yeah. And people, and yeah. it just, it sets off, um, you know, the bullshit alarm if people are like, oh, you're telling me about this new thing and uh -huh. it sounds exciting, but it's really all about your software. And it's like, okay, I'm being sold to, you know, and that, that <laughs> nobody, as soon as you yeah. trigger that in people, then they're like, okay, I'm going to, uh -huh. this isn't helping me. A hundred percent. So let's back into this. And I think the, one of the biggest questions I have about this, and I think folks on the call may too, is, you know, around narrative design and getting your story figured out is like, like, where do you start if you're, you know, if you're a startup or you're, you're a company, a marketer somewhere that wants to like, Hey, Marcus sounds good. Like what, what is the legwork like that goes into getting this figured out? Like, what do you actually do to get started here? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the part, part of the reason why it's so relevant today is because there's just, you know, there's so much competition in every, in every single space, right? So if mm -hmm. you're launching a CRM today, you have, I don't know. There's like hundreds and hundreds of, of other CRMs that are you're going to be competing with. Or if you're launching, yeah. there are very few markets that are like young and immature. Most markets are, if you're launching something into it, there are, you know, literally mm -hmm. hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of com competitors. And so you have to think about your, and like, and what's very natural is that like for a lot of young companies, when they go into a new market, they sort of adopt this that like they adopt the status quo of whatever story is being told. So, you know, if you go and mm -hmm. I learned this the hard way, like when I was marketing, um, marketing automation at, at HubSpot, you know, we, we started, we like, we got to a marketing message of it's marketing beyond marketing automation beyond email. And I did like a quick audit of like mm -hmm. our top five competitors after we had created this, you know, mm -hmm. message that we thought we were like, creating in a bubble. And I went out and I looked at like five of our top competitors and they all had the exact same message, which was marketing automation beyond email, marketing automation. <laughs> beyond email. And I'm like, yeah. whoa, you know, <laughs> and if yeah. you look at your space, it's very likely that's happening. And if you look at new startups, it's they like, they, sometimes they'll adopt the same color scheme that their biggest competitors <laughs> have and the, yeah. same and the same, and it all looks the fucking same. And it's like, yeah. you go into a space and it's like, hey, there's this conformity that happens. And mm -hmm. you don't want to do that because if you go into a space where there's hundreds and hundreds of competitors, like, I think the natural feeling is like, oh, maybe if I'm a young company and I look like the big established company, people will trust me a little bit more and they'll, they, they won't think that I'm like new and different and small and not good, but really the opposite happens. You just kind of blend in with everybody and nobody understands you don't have a strong identity. So the idea is 
understand your space, look at the narrative that's out there and then design your own narrative. And if it's a big space, you sort of, every, every company needs sort of a wedge into that space, right? It's like, maybe if it's CRM and there's 500 CRM companies, maybe you're the CRM for healthcare, or maybe you're the CRM for enterprise pet food brands, or maybe, you know, like that's, mm-hmm. that's company strategy, but your story should also um, bring that to life and be really tightly tied to that. So, I mean, that's, that's the reason why you do it. And like, the other thing is, is that like, if your strategy is to be the, you know, the, the CRM for enterprise pet food companies, you don't communicate it by saying, maybe you do by whether you're like the way you communicate it is through a story and your story Mm. sort of embodies the strategy of your company. So those companies that are really good storytellers have a really clear identity. They're telling you their company strategy, but they're not Mm. saying like, you know, they're doing it through a story and they're doing it through a way that's like very engaging and entertaining. So mm-hmm. that's why you do it. That's like why it exists. Like most companies still go out and don't think about this stuff. They don't design mm-hmm. their narrative. They don't spend mm-hmm. any time on it. They just kind of like, you know, they hire some marketers, they slap stuff together. It's usually pretty status quo and, the, you know, they're doing their best. But if you take this time to like work on the story up front, pay attention to what's going on in your space, then uh, it gives you a, a big boost as a company, especially a smaller company. Because yeah. you can move faster, you can operate uh, with more like purpose and atten- intention when mm-hmm. you have a clear story and a clear strategy, and it gives you an advantage uh, against bigger competitors. Are there are there tactical <laughs> things folks can do to to either get started or like kind of do this come correct when they're putting this together? Think you know user interviews <clears throat> or um, yeah. kind of in, you know intelligence gathering. Like, what's the sort of what's your recommended course of action on like yeah, a real so- tactical level? So the, so the first thing to do is Brian Halligan, the CEO of HubSpot would always talk about this, but he's, he would say that you got to be like a cultural and anthropologist, you know, with mm-hmm. your target market. So you got to mm-hmm. know if your target market is product marketers, you got to know what is going on with those people, you know, just mm-hmm. like how, what is changing, been especially what is changing in their world. If you notice all of a sudden, like, and I'll try to give you an example of it, you know, if you notice like with Pendo, our target is really product teams. And like we, we've we seen this big shift of companies relying more on their product to like, to get things done, right? Like instead of like, they're, like companies are able to grow through their product with product led growth. They still use salespeople um, mm-hmm. and they still have sales and marketing teams, right? But now they're adding in like a product led motion and product teams are responsible for that. So like, okay, we need to pay attention to that and make sure we understand it and then figure out ways to help them. So like, that's number one, because, and, but there's also like, there's, there's things that are changed. So, that, and that's like a very job specific thing, but you'd also look at things that are changing in the world. Like a good example of that right now is that like, you know, this like software industries, we're dealing with a whole bunch of changes. Valuations have really changed. You know, companies are slowing down in this quarter or whatever, like, what, what impact is that having on your specific target audience? Like, what does that mean for product teams or if your audience's marketing teams or like, there's a translation bit that happens. Same thing. Another example is like when the pandemic started, huge, massive, life altering, world changing situation that happened in like a month. Mm-hmm. What if you're, if you're a company that cares about teachers, what is the impact that had on teachers? Like, Oh, all of a sudden I have to think of like virtual classes. How do I do that? You know, like all the things that they're thinking about. So that's, that's number one. And once you understand that change, you know, looking for the change, always being aware of the change, always being tuned into things that are changing in your world, trying to like translate that to the impact that's having with your audience, because people really want help with that. Because Mm -hmm. like, you know, if you know, that there's like, it, like, let's say, let's go back to the pandemic example. There's been a pandemic and you mm-hmm. care about teachers and you're seeing all these things changing with what teachers have to deal with. If you can help other teachers adapt to that change, you become a real asset, right? And mm-hmm. so it's like, hey, we have been paying attention to this change. We're talking to people who are going through it. And here's what we've learned. That is when all of a sudden you become, you're no longer selling to an audience. You are a helpful advisor. You are like, okay, I'm a teacher. I'm going through this change. Yes, please tell me what others are doing. Like help me understand it and help me navigate it. So you're looking Mm -hmm. for change. You're looking for how people are adapting to change. You're trying to help people adapt to this change. And then if it's something that like, 
you know, you want to market and sell, you put a name on it. And so like, mm -hmm. I don't know if a company ever did this, right? But you could say, there's been a pandemic, teachers have to adapt, they have to adapt by doing x, y, and z. We call this new thing virtual learning. And you know what, mm -hmm. here's the here's the virtual learning playbook that we've picked up on. And like, you can do this without us. But we've built some tools to help you with the virtual learning playbook. And like, here's how so like, that's an example of it. And mm -hmm. like inbound marketing, you know, was the first example I was exposed to of this that they did it in like 2018. But their change was that people like outbound or people are ignoring ads. They've all got DVRs. They've all got like ad blockers and no one's paying attention to ads anymore. That's this mm -hmm. change. The impact on a specific audience marketers means that is that your outbound marketing spend isn't working anymore. Um, but mm -hmm. this new, the way to adapt is to work to inter integrate these new inbound marketing channels that we're seeing people use. Um, mm -hmm. We call this change inbound marketing. Here's how you do it. And then like, oh yeah, we built a bunch of tools to help you do it. So that's kind of the format. Yeah. And like, those are the things you should be looking for. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, HubSpot's such a great, like it's, it's the example I always come back to with this kind of, you know, this kind of story design and especially the way that the, the other change they, they really picked up on was the, the barriers to entry to traditional publishing and audience building had sort of gotten eradicated because of the internet, yep. which shook up the further shook up the impact that traditional paid media could have on, you know, audience development. So but what that also did was, you know, opened the barriers to entry to publishing for a company. So yeah. why go rent space from some trade journal for an advertisement when you can start your own publication for free on your website and earn the attention of your audience that way in a, in a yeah. more authentic way. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. then, and then sort of the, the kind of one thing leads to another and eventually you put a name to it and eventually you put a product offering behind that name. And yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, great lessons yeah. with storytelling there. Yeah. And, and most pro you know, most company stories or most product stories are usually flipped the other way. You know, they will start either with the product, like the, the worst ones start with the product where it's like, and there's a few different structures of storytelling. The worst ones start with the product where, where it's usually mm -hmm. like our product is awesome. Here's what it does. That one yeah. is tough, <laughs> you know, yeah. and it, but it's, a lot of people default to that. The most people, you know, and this is the, I, I call it the shark tank pitch because, it, you know, if you watch shark tank or if you've ever seen an episode of shark tank, they're always mm -hmm. structured. The pitches are always structured exactly the same and it's problem solution. And usually most people mm -hmm. still default to that. And it's not the worst thing you can do, but you normally, when you see a product story today, it's like, Hey, you've got this, let me tell you about this problem that you have. And here's our solution. And then they really outline the problem and then they give the solution to the problem. Um, mm -hmm. and the trouble with that is that like, maybe you get the solution right or sorry maybe you get the problem right maybe mm. you don't see and if you you know if you nail the problem sure you can sell those people but it's usually like a very small number of people who have that exact problem and mm -hmm. anybody else who doesn't have that problem again it feels like you're selling to them very hard where it's like stop convincing me i have this problem and there's been a lot of like you know like when you come at someone with, with a problem that they don't have, or one that's a little bit wrong, again, it feels really like salesy, but also like you're trying to convince them of something that they don't have or don't want, where if you start with a change in the world, that's sort of undeniable and then take them on a journey, it's much more clear. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the problem solution storytelling is like, is everywhere. It's simple. It can help in certain instances, but it's really not that interesting. You know, it always reminds me of like, there's this always sunny in Philadelphia episode hmm. where like Charlie Day is trying to sell kitten mittens, which is like <laughs> you know, a problem to a solution, like a solution yeah. to a problem that doesn't exist. Yeah. And his bitch is like, You're, is your cat making yeah. too much noise? <laughs> and that's what, that's what most marketers sound like. You know, is your cat making too much noise? That's what I hear when I hear a lot of pitches out there. And it's just like, no, I don't even have a cat. You know, it's like, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, you know, yeah, you think of like, think of like the big seismic shifts in, you know, technology adoptions and like people didn't, you know, people didn't know the, the problem with their traditional iPhone, with their traditional cell phones before iPhones existed. Right. Or, you know, if right. you went to, you know, if you went to people with horse and buggies at the turn of the last century and showed them cars, like they're not, you're not selling them on the problems with their horse and buggy. It's this massively new, you know, new yeah. opportunity in front of them. It's not, you know, you're yeah. not talking about the problems with the horse. You're talking about the opportunity with the car. I think that's yes. the flip in thinking there. 
It is. And it's, you know, you get it, you get a little bit into, and talk about it too, because there is a really good book by Christopher Lockheed, which is Think mm. Bigger. Mm -hmm. And that's like all his thing is like category creation. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a little bit different from what I, I love his stuff. And I think he's super smart and he's got a great point of view, but I think he leans too heavily into like creating a new category. And for most companies trying to create a new category is usually a mistake and it's just hard. Mm -hmm. um, but any, any company can design their own narrative. You know, it's like, you don't need to create this when you yeah. create a story that's different you're not necessarily creating a whole new category that requires this massive leap of faith, you know, mm -hmm. and like to create a new category, you really have to get people to jump off the deep end with you. And like for some technologies or some companies that makes a lot of sense, but mm -hmm. I think any company can and should design their own narrative and take hold of their own narrative. And you can do that without like trying to create something that is, you know, a category that completely doesn't exist. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Before we jump into live questions, I'd like to yeah. touch a little bit on, you know, what are your recommendations around just once you get this sort of put together, how do you roll it out? Where does it live? How do you implement it? I, I've yeah. been stuck there as a product marketer in the past. I think a lot of folks are, whether it's like messaging or kind of intelligence documentation, like the, you know, I put this great presentation together. There's this deck, there's this notion space that kind of becomes yeah. shelfware? Like, how do you kind of break through and have that actually put to use and making an impact? Yeah, I mean, that that's one of my favorite things because I do think like that is the most important. It's at least half of the battle, right? Like, you mm -hmm. know, getting this stuff, creating the story and having the framework and like, you can kind of do that. And there's a lot of people who can help you do that. But like, I mean, I spent a lot of my career like trying to push it through different companies. And that's mm -hmm. the hard part. And that's usually the battle that like, you know, a PM and a product team or a PMM and a PM will face. So I've done it a bunch and I've failed at it a bunch and I've like succeeded at it a bunch. So like, I mean, the, the, the place where I had the most success was when we worked with the CEO on it. So like, you know, we were launching a new product line at HubSpot service hub. And I had this whole narrative that I created, which I was really excited about, but this was before the narrative design process that I knew. And we took the narrative, I, like I took the pitch. I went into the C-suite. I gave him the pitch and the story. The CEO said like, okay, this is, this is fine. But like, I'm going to, he went up to the whiteboard and he basically drew the five slides of narrative design on the whiteboard. And he's like, I want you to take your pitch and I want you to put it into this structure. And then mm -hmm. that's how we started working on it together. And I learned a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And so that made everything a lot easier when the CEO is the storyteller and believes in it and knows about it. Like then things are going to, doors are going to open that were closed before, which is great. That's usually not going to happen for everybody. And that's okay because you can sort of do this on multiple levels. So I think like what we did with that, with that story service hub was a, that was, we were launching a product line. So one place it's really successful and really helpful is if that you have a big product launch is to use this, use the narrative design process to create a new game. You know, if you're like creating a company you're launching a new product. There's a there's some opportunity where it's like, wow, we need a way to connect with the market to support this big launch. Then you can create it, and it's very natural for like your marketing team and your sales team and even your CEO and whoever to pick this stuff up, to pick it up and adopt it because it is the strategy. So as long as there's clear strategy coming from, you know, your CEO, if you turn that into a story as the marketing lead then it's something that like I've then will successfully get out to the other teams and be used. And you can usually, you can think about narrative design as it, the steps match pretty well to your marketing funnel. So like, you know, mm -hmm. if you go to your VP of brand or content or whatever with the narrative design story, you can help focus them a lot on like the change that's happening in the world, because that's the thing where you need a lot of top of funnel support. And the mm -hmm. bottom step for, for another example is like, what is this new game and why it's so hard? And then how does your product help people, you know, play this new game and achieve success with this new game? That's a sales mm -hmm. story. Like your sales team really needs to be able to tell that story because they need to talk about like, what is this new thing that everybody's doing? And then how does your product help solve for it? So that's one thing I would say, well, get your CEO involved. He believes in it or she believes in it. Like you're going to have a lot of success tie it to a launch, tie it to the funnel. But also mm -hmm. if you are just a PM and a PMM working on a product together, you can use this format 
and you will get people will be like what are they doing you know like what is going on with that team like all of a sudden they have a lot of momentum and identity around this product and are telling a really interesting story and then things start to like bubble up too so you can kind mm-hmm. of do it bottoms up as well where and i've done that before where you know as the pmm i bring this story to a product and it mm-hmm. really helps shape the product it gives it helps the product team prioritize the roadmap and think about the future of it and then it gives the product a lot of identity and helps teams market it too so you can mm-hmm. do both of those things and it's not a failure if like it, it, you know yeah. only you and your pm are the ones using it at first mm-hmm. so, yeah <laughs> that's yeah that's all great advice i especially love the part about mapping the right parts of the story to the right parts of the funnel I think that's a, I've seen that that's a mistake I've fallen into where you try to tell everyone the full, like you get the customer on the phone and you just like, we got to exhaust the full top to bottom story. And the fact is like, if you're in, for example, a sales demo context, like if, if you've effectively like brought them into your marketing funnel by now, they've heard the story at the kind of highest level, they've gotten the 30,000 foot view from you know your your marketing site the other materials that they've seen by the time they're in a demo doing some product consideration there's a different kind of tactical level you don't need to start from zero at that point yeah 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 totally agree with that and like yeah that's a good point i mean i've worked on a lot of um you know the story does translate really well to the sales stack but yeah it's a great point around the sales like it the the sales stack has to be so short like in, so mm-hmm. hopefully you can tell the story, the story, a truncated version of it that yeah. gets across the key point in like, you know, <laughs> a slide or two and yeah. like doing that's really hard. But if you can give your sales team that story, it does help. I, I like to call it the P, like a POV because mm-hmm. what I'll do and what always resonates What this is what I did at Pendo and it resonates with our sales team. And like, I think it resonates with customers on calls too. It's like, you know, basically, if you've got a customer on the phone for the first time and they don't know too much about your product, you can say, you know, hey, I'm Marcus, I'm excited to show you the product, but there's a lot of companies that build for product teams in this space. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about like our point of view, like here's how mm-hmm. we think about things. And then yeah. I have two or three slides that share like our point of view on this mm-hmm. world. And that's it. Yeah. And then I've already, then I've planted the seeds that I need to, to put them yeah. in the right mind space to like, to understand who we are and Mm. why we think about things we do. And then you show them the the product and the solutions, and then you just do discovery, but that's all you need Mm. usually. That's, that's great, great advice. I I, I hope if folks take one thing away from this, it's that because it, it kills me. I've, I've been cringed on way too many calls where you can see that part of the deck just dragging on and you can see the person start to tune out and it's like, it's okay to leave them wanting more for those bits, like jump into fulfilling what they're there for. Yes. Yes. You can't, And so like, there's a lot of salespeople who like, oh, I hate slides and I don't need need to do this. And it's Mm. like, it's, and like, I don't blame you because you don't want a product marketer to come in and be like, Hey, here's the 20 slides that you got to run through. You know, it's like, right. Right. And and that's like, Hey, it's just, it's set up. It's like, I'm going to show you what you want to see. We're going to get right into it. I just want to give you our point of view. This is how we think about the world. And like, if you can't share it in less than five minutes, like two or three minutes, you really got to make it shorter because yes, that's, yeah. You're otherwise you're just boring people to death. Yeah. Then they're tuning out before the demo even starts. Okay. Speaking of short and sweet, we've got about 10 minutes here. Let's jump into some live questions. I'm seeing questions here. I think Steve's going to pop them on the screen and I'll just read cool. them out. We'll get through what we can. So Matt, Matt O'Connell from Vistale asks, should the narrative be driven or decided by the CEO slash founders, or is it okay if the product marketing team owns this? Yeah. So the, you know, the company strategy and the product strategy is always going to come from the CEO and founders and like, you know, the, the, the CPO or whatever. Um, So the, 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 you as the product marketing team, you're not making that part up, right? Like you're not going to, you're not going to, your job is to articulate what that strategy is in a story. So if the Mm -hmm. strategy is that we are going to focus on SMB companies who, you know, create hardware in Europe, like you're not changing any of that. You just need to hone yeah. in on that audience and think about the story for that audience. So, you know, a lot of the time it depends on the CEO and founders. Sometimes they're marketers yeah. and storytellers. Sometimes they're not. If you create an awesome articulation of their strategy, they will be into it. Um, mm-hmm. But you got to pull them into the process and you got to help them shape it. They will care. Every founder will care deeply about it. But so, yeah, it's tricky. 
that's a tough one, but I think that's how I think about it. Yeah. Good advice. We've got one from anonymous question here. We've got, how do you test if a narrative resonates with potential users and ultimately leads to product adoption and sales? That's a great question. Yeah. I've definitely been here myself. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, there's a lot of ways to test it. I think your sales team is probably the best is usually the best way to test it. You know, they will give you direct feedback when they see something, but also like, I love snooping on sales and gong and just seeing how they're using oh, yeah. like the new slides and it's awesome. And you can pick up a lot there too. And yeah. you know, you will know if, if someone, you'll know if they use it and you yeah. also, you can't be like with sales, you can't be overly, you, you have to give this to sales as a tool. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll create a lot, I'll create these slides for sales and this like an amazing salesperson will just use like one slide. And I'm like, mm -hmm. if they still close deals, like it's fine. It's cool. Yeah. I've also yeah. seen salespeople use the entire narrative. Right? Yeah. So like, what are they using versus what, like, if nobody's using your story, you've probably mm -hmm. got to start over and try yeah. again. If yeah. they're using it and kind of using it, cool. But basically like, mm -hmm. are you like, is the prospect's head nodding or is whoever they're yeah. telling the story to, are they like, yeah, that's us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we're deep. That's the problems we have. Like, yes, we're dealing with that. Tell me more. So that's one way. Mm -hmm. And, and you can sit on those sales calls or you can just, you should take the, the, the pitch deck out and practice yourself with customers or prospects. And then mm -hmm. also with like content, you know, so if like, mm -hmm. is your content resonating in social, like test it on LinkedIn, like go out and try to, you know, have your CEO and founder, or just you like go and post stuff on LinkedIn and see if it gets a response and try it in talks mm -hmm. and like, and it's always, it's never finished. Like you should never yeah. dramatically change the narrative, but you can mm. always iterate on it and change things and, and improve it. Yeah. And you should be doing that based on feedback. And I think that's the sign of, of kind of a next level product marketer is that one that's, Hey, this has been out there two weeks. We, you know, we noticed this, this, and this, so we're going to adjust this and let's try this. And you know, they're, they're kind of in, yeah. in action. They don't just sort of ship it and go to sleep. Yeah. Cool. Let's see if we can get through a few more here. We've got Adam speaking of Excellent product marketers. We've got Adam from Launch Notes asking, how is the importance of narrative design similar at Google, HubSpot, Pen and how is the, I, I imagine it got cut off here, but how is the implementation different with narrative design across those three companies, I think is the question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Google's like the size of these companies are all different, right? And like Google's um, stories, I mean, Google's like so many different companies at this point. So like it wasn't, and it wasn't a framework I really had when I was there and they're just not as narrative driven. I mean, some of their products mm -hmm. are HubSpot's extremely narrative driven mm -hmm. and everything they do is a story. And I think they, you know, they use marketing as a tool better than most companies. But one thing I'll say, and then Pendo is like different too, because Pendo is it's not as like you know, it's not as story driven as HubSpot, but we do have this big story that we talk about a lot, which is just the world becoming more product, like software companies becoming more product led and the, <laughs> the basically, you know, this big shift that's happening with product led growth and, and sales and marketing and all these companies are all these parts of organization shifting, becoming more product led. But I think one thing that is helpful is that you got to know your audience a little bit too. Like the implementation of a story at a company where you're really focused on like SMB and mid market, like HubSpot, you're going to spend more time on telling the story at scale through your marketing channels. And at Pendo, where our companies are more up market and we're focused more on a little bit more on the enterprise, we're using that story more so with our sales team and in some of those less scaled channels where the messaging is going to resonate. So like, that's a big one, you know, mm -hmm. like you can't in that, like you got to know your audience and know the channels to reach them and think about how you implement this, where, where is it going to help you the most based mm -hmm. on the right ways to reach your audience? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent advice. Our next question here is uh, any tips for how to tie our launches back to our narrative, even if we're just announcing some small improvements or do you have any examples? Great question. And we here at launch notes, we, you know, we celebrate the, the shipping and celebrating of small improvements as much as possible. So this is right in our wheelhouse. Yeah. I mean, they should always ladder up into this larger story, you know? So mm -hmm. if your overall narrative, you know, live from that HubSpot example is like inbound marketing, then every launch you have should talk about, you know, you like the product is what is what solves the challenges of doing inbound marketing. So inbound marketing mm -hmm. is hard to do because you've got to, you know, create a blog and start using social media and like start, you know, all these different things. And the product is what helps 
solve those problems of the of your new game. So it should always ladder up into it. So you could start every post off, you know, with an with a with a paragraph about like whatever that larger narrative is, and then use that narrative to get down into a specific section of your of the challenge of that new game and then how you're solving it with that product. Mm. But yeah, that your over yeah. your your larger narrative is this uniting thread that makes all of your your features feel like they're part of the same strategy and vision and goal. Um, mm. And they're not just like a a one-off disparate thing. So you don't want to narrative design every single feature launch. Mm -hmm. You want to have one overall company story. Your individual products should fit in to that larger story in different and mm -hmm. unique ways. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, it shouldn't be its own story. Yeah. And I, I, that's great advice. And I'd add to that, that, you know, even the smallest improvements are going to ladder up into some part of your platform. And that part of that platform exists for a reason. So kind of connect those dots for the customer and let, let them know like, Hey, we're doing this. Like it might feel like a small update and it is, but it's actually part of us sweating the details on this key part of our platform, which is really important for this bigger kind of narrative that we've been talking about. Like, so, so that's why we're doing it and kind of like getting into the why and connecting those dots for the, for folks. Yeah. We've got a question here. Would you recommend getting customer feedback slash buy-in while creating brand narrative? Good question. Yeah, definitely. I mean, to know, to understand the change in the world and then to understand how the right way to adapt to that change, you have to be talking to customers. You can't make that stuff up on your own. Otherwise uh -huh. it will not work. So, you know, maybe you can see some of these changes happen, like back to that teacher pandemic example, like the pandemic is obvious. This change is happening. It's even ch obvious that it's going to have a big impact on schools, but how do people, how are teachers dealing with it and adapting to that change? You're not going to know unless, you know, you're a teacher, but that's your only, that's only been one experience. You got to go and you have to talk to people. That's still the primary way to do it. So, you know, mm -hmm. I always like to lean on my partner teams as much as possible. Like I can go out and mm -hmm. I can talk to one salesperson who has an awesome perspective because it's, you know, they've talked to 20 people and I can learn yeah. a lot from them pretty quickly, but you yeah. should also do the work to talk to individual customers for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think we will wrap up with this final question. Do you think narrative design and storytelling is a skill that can be developed? And if so, how? I have a feeling. I have a feeling that you uh, uh, have an answer for us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's. I think every PMM needs to. Every PMM and PM too. Like you know, if you're going out there and trying to get hired and stand out and differentiate, you need to have some skill that you're really good at. For me, you know, it's storytelling. It's narrative design developing that skill set is something that I just invested in to do. So 100%, I think that it can become a skill of everybody, even if it doesn't feel like one. And to build it, you know, there's a lot of good resources out there. I've written a lot about it. I have a course with the PMM, with the PMA Narrative Design Masterclass, which I rolled out with them, which you can, the Product Marketing Alliance, which is, was a labor of love, but I feel like it's a pretty good course if you want to deep dive into this stuff. But there's a ton to read and there's a ton to learn. You know, I think the thing to do is to go out and probably like figure out the right way to learn this stuff. And you can read, you know, some of my blog posts and you can read Think Bigger. You could take this narrative design course, but then you got to get it into practice too. Like you won't, like you learn it and you got to practice it and you won't get good at it until you've had some time to develop it and really like get the reps on this stuff. And it's easy to get reps on it. Like, because you can do the stuff on your own. Like I used the, uh, like I learned the narrative design process and then I use the narrative design process to invent narrative design, which is like my new game. And if yeah. you look, if you read one of my first blog posts about narrative design, it's like, it's very obvious that the process I'm teaching you about, I built it yeah. with the process that I'm teaching you about. Amazing. So you can go out, you can, yeah, you can, you can blog about this stuff. You can use it. You can like get reps just posting the LinkedIn mm. It's out there, but yeah. And you can yeah. like follow yeah. me on LinkedIn. That's a good, if you want to learn more about this stuff and easily and are, are feeling lazy, the easiest way, which is totally cool. is just follow me on LinkedIn. I post about this stuff all the time and you'll find resources. Amazing. Yeah. We'll definitely, definitely point folks there. And uh, if you're, if you're here in the chat now, Steve just dropped a link to the, the course that you oh, mentioned. Cool. So Thanks, be sure to Steve. check that out. Yeah. Be sure to check that out. Cool. Well, we'll do a quick reminder for folks before we wrap up here. We're also going to drop a link in to join the Launch Awesome community. If you're not a part of it, if you want to hear about future events like this ahead of time, go ahead and give that a join. It's free and we are going to be having even more exciting events like this coming up soon. 
And yeah, Marcus, thanks. Thanks so much for being here. This was incredible info. I, I know folks got a lot out of it. I certainly did. Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Appreciate it. Nice. Thanks for everybody joining. All right. Thanks all. Cheers.